All right, so I'm glad you guys are all here. I'm glad you're wanting to take Dynamics this summer, or I guess whether or not you're wanting to, here we are. So I uh, wanted to start off with a overview, kind of a big picture of what are we doing here in Dynamics. And uh, I, I like this picture right here to kind of describe the study of Dynamics. Uh, so as a way of introing what we're gonna be doing here, what you see on this picture is that there's sort of a foundation for dynamics, and that foundation is called kinematics. Kinematics is the study of motion. It's basically how do you describe motion? You know, that can be position, that can be velocity, it can be acceleration. There are actually even more terms, things that are called things like jerk. Um, but this is basically setting up mathematics that allows us to describe uh, movement of things accurately, okay, using math. Um, and so that's what you see down there on the bottom part of this little figure is that uh, all the rest of what we study in uh, dynamics is built upon that foundation. Then what you see actually moving uh, sort of front to back there, you see that we actually have two different kinds of kinematics that we can study. We can study the motion of things that can be considered particles or we can study the motion of things that can be considered more like a rigid body. And the difference between those two is that a particle is basically something where the size of the particle is not really important. Uh, another way of saying this is that we don't really care about the rotation of the object when we're talking about particles. We're purely looking at issues of translation when we are thinking about particles, all right? Whereas for the case of rigid bodies, they are things that are larger, and therefore, often, if they are larger, we have to look at the balancing of forces and torques that might make the thing rotate, okay? So those are kind of the two different ways that we can uh, think about things moving. Uh, they also have associated with them forces and moments, obviously, which are things that influence uh, the motion of those things. And that's where the upper layer that you see here uh, for this little figure comes in, the, the study of kinetics. So kinematics is describing how things move. Kinetics is basically approaching why do things move? What is causing the changes in the motion of particular objects, all right? So we have to get into things like forces. Uh, energy comes in there occasionally. Um, and as a matter of fact, there are essentially three different uh, sort of methodologies to approach how, or, or like why do things move. The very first one that we'll start looking at in this course basically operates off of New Newton's second law. You see it over there, Newton's second law. It uses this uh, relationship that F equals MA. You can see there that F equals MA is an equation that relates forces with accelerations. Acceleration is inherently a way of describing motion, right? Force is not so much describing the motion, it's describing an influence that may influence motion. Does that make sense? So uh, that's gonna be where we start out once we start looking at kinetics. Uh, later in the course, we will move into another method that's called work energy. And it's basically looking, instead of so much directly at the forces, we are going to look at how different types of motion might have various amounts of energy associated with it and we use uh, the principle of the cons conservation of energy in order to uh, do some interesting mathematics and, and come up with some conclusions with respect to the kinetics of a particular situation. And then another thing we'll get into is this idea of impulse and momentum. So impulse is the idea that when you apply a force over a particular period of time, that force can influence the amount of momentum that a particular particle or body possesses, all right? And each of those areas can be done either for particles or for rigid bodies. And again, the division is, are you looking at things that are sort of purely translational or are you looking at things that are both translational and rotational, okay? And we're actually gonna go through all of these different things in this course. Where we're starting out today is in that little yellow uh, kinematics block that you see as a foundation of, of the other things that we are going to be doing. 
all right? And all of the kinetic stuff that we do is built on top of the idea that we can describe how things move using math. And so that's kind of where the entry point is for most calculus courses is to start, you know, looking more deeply about how you can describe motion. All right, we good so far? All right, so let's actually get into some, you know, some very initial definitions of things. Okay, so I'll say up here definitions. And we'll actually kind of talk through some uh, sign conventions as well. Okay, and we're going to do this for a purely one-dimensional case, at least at first. Okay, what I mean by a 1D case is that we have sort of a, a line along which a particle could be moving. All right. So imagine that there's a particle sitting here on this line and that particle might move from an initial position to another position. And we can describe that motion with a couple of things. First of all, we describe displacement relative to an origin. And the way your book does this is with the variable s. Okay? I don't particularly like the use of the variable s because we use it a lot as the unit of seconds but I'll kind of match what they do here for now so that it's not confusing. There's this idea of displacement and they use the variable S. And then here we have a delta S. Okay, this is kind of uh, how did the, the uh, position of that particle uh, change along this sort of linear line. What I actually prefer to do on these is uh, instead of talking in terms of S, what I prefer to do is think of this as maybe like an X axis. Right? And then you can use a variable x instead of s. Uh, the, the big advantage, I guess, of using s is that s implies that it is motion along a path. And the path doesn't necessarily have to be a straight line. All right? So that just understand that's what they mean in the book when they use s, is that it's how far has something proceeded along a path. Uh, and that's not, you don't really get that out of just using an x or a y. All right? So, um, when we look at this, this S, I think I said this already, but S is displacement. Okay? And again, it's a displacement along a path. Okay? And uh, what I want to say here right at the very beginning is that this displacement along the path, uh, anytime we are talking about rightward, or upward, unless we make special effort to define it differently, uh, we're going to assume that rightward and upward are positive. Okay, so that's a sign convention that we are going to typically use with our problems. Now, I, I want to go ahead and say this too, that whether something is rightward or upward is kind of a matter of perspective. Is that right? So if you think about an XY axis, uh, to me, I'm looking at this and it's an XY axis and something that moves to the right for me, what's it look like for you? It looks like it's going left. So when I do this, it's, it's even not something that's super absolute, but it can have some meaning with respect to how you've drawn it on the page, for instance, right? So we'll just use that as our standard sign convention is that rightward or upward is going to be positive, okay? The next thing that matters to us with respect to motion is the idea of velocity, Okay, and we can define the velocity a, a couple of different ways. One of the ways we can do it is as an average velocity. So I'll say here, this is average. How do I define average velocity, do you think? Relative to my, my one-dimensional case that I have up there of S and delta S. Should it be like a delta S over delta T, where T is time? Right, so an average velocity over a particular change of position given a change in time is just the ratio of those two quantities. All right? That's an average velocity. A lot of times, though, we don't necessarily want to stay in the domain of having an average velocity. We a lot of times want to talk about something that is an instantaneous velocity. Okay, so I'll just say instantaneous here and say, for instantaneous, what do we change? 
Okay, instead of delta S over delta T, we want to move this to being DS DT. What's the difference? What's the difference between me using a delta there and using a lowercase d? Okay, those are actually called differentials. Differentials is imagine that being an infinitesimally small change in s, right? So imagine if I could draw it, another dot that was to the right of this thing, but just really, really, really close to it to the point where we couldn't even say that it had any size at all, right? Very, very, very you know, infinitesimally small is how we'd talk about this kind of thing in calculus. And of course, the amount of time that it might take for it to move that infinitesimally small amount of distance is an infinitesimally small amount of time. And that's what the dt refers to. And when we think about that ds dt, that is just a derivative of the displacement with respect to time. Right? What you're doing is just making those, those uh, changes uh, really, really small. Okay? And we're going to deal with that a, a good bit. What do you think this next uh, type of thing is I'm going to describe here? Acceleration. OK, acceleration. What if I want an average acceleration? OK, I'll say A is going to be equal to what? What do you think? A is going to be equal to a change for aver the average case here. It's a change in amount of velocity. Okay, so imagine this being at this point in time, I have a particular velocity. Okay, maybe I'll call that uh, v sub zero. And then here, maybe I have a different velocity of that point. Maybe I'll call that v sub one. There's been a change over that period of time in the amount of velocity that there is, right? So that's this change in velocity. If I take that change in velocity and divide it by a change in the amount of time, so you know, for that first one, that would be presumably maybe at a time zero, and this would be at a time one. So you're actually at a different time now, and the change between those two periods or those two instants in time uh, is what I'm talking about with delta t down there. And if you take just the ratio of those two finite values of change, then that gives you an average acceleration, All right? What do you think we're going to do with that one? To go to an instantaneous type of uh, acceleration. A is just going to become what? dv dt. Okay, so dv dt again is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. Okay, since v is a derivative of position or displacement with respect to time, then it would be fair to say that this is just the second derivative, okay, which you can write as d squared s over dt squared. Okay, and for all of these things, uh, rightward and upward kind of defines our sign convention. So what does that mean with respect to velocity? Okay, for, for this down here with respect to velocity, we mean, uh, you know, picking up speed like, or, or picking up position going rightward, right? It means you actually have, as you move through time, you are moving further and further to the right. That means you have a positive velocity. If you are uh, going further and further to the left, that means you have a negative velocity. Okay. So uh, again, move where in the first case you have a position that's rightward or leftward. Uh, or rightward would be positive, or upward would be positive. Um, now we're talking about how it is actually changing in position or moving. Okay. What about the last one? For our, for our accelerations, what this means is that if you are picking up speed going to the right, in other words, you were moving at some velocity going right at this instant in time, and then in the next instant of time, you have more speed than the last one, 
right? That means you are accelerating. What if you're going a certain speed going to the right, and then a couple seconds later, you're still going to the right, but you're now going slower? That's called deceleration, okay? Um, and actually, we can kind of generalize that even a little bit more. We can say if velocity and acceleration, okay, so between velocity and acceleration, if they have the same sign, what, what would we call that? That would, you guys just use the terms, this is acceleration. And what if they have the opposite sign? That would be called deceleration, okay? All right, so what we mean is, you know, this works the other way. What if you're moving left, right, and you have a particular velocity, which would be negative, right? If you're moving left, you have a velocity that's negative, and then you have a velocity that's even more negative the next time, right? That means both of your signs are the same, which means you're actually accelerating, right? You're picking up speed, which is, uh, I think, a pretty cool idea there. All right, any questions so far? This is sort of our starting point. We have to define, using these uh, calculus terms here, we have to define what we mean by these various kinds of motion that we are going to care about with respect to the movement of particles. Any questions yet? All right, so what we're gonna do now is look at a few graphs, okay? We're gonna look at some of these things graphically. All right, I'll call this S, V, and A relationships graphically, okay? We'll do a few different ones of them because I think it helps us get a mental picture of what we're talking about here. The first one that we're gonna do is called, or it's the ST curve, okay? So S being what? S is displacement, and this is time, and the shape of this curve I draw on here doesn't matter, so don't, don't think that that's what I'm really trying to get you to see, so I'm just gonna draw just some shape of a curve that's in this, um, on this graph between S and T. The first thing I want to think about is at a particular point, think of the tangent line at that point, and we're going to think about the slope of the tangent line at that point, okay? How do you describe the slope of a tangent line at a point mathematically? It's not a trick question. That would be a derivative, right? So hopefully, you know, hopefully that's something you guys are comfortable with out of calculus. So we have a derivative that describes the slope of this tangent line at this point. And what we mean by that in, in the ST space right here is that is going to be ds dt. That's the derivative with respect to time for where this curve um, has a tangent line at this point. Okay, And we call that velocity. So a tangent line to a curve that exists in this position versus time. Uh, if you have a graph that describes position versus time, the tangent line describes velocity. Okay, so let me actually write that out over here. We'll say the slope of uh, the ST curve is V. Okay, and that's kind of about all I want to do with that one as of right now. Let's look at another relationship. Let's look at velocity and time. Okay, so again, I'm going to draw just a kind of a little curve on here. The shape of the curve doesn't matter. I just want you to see that there could be a curve that describes the relationship between velocity and time. And again, we'll look at, uh, you could come up with a slope of a tangent line to this curve at any given point. And so again, we'll say the slope 
but this time we'll say the slope of the VT curve. Okay, and what do you think this is going to be? Slope of the VT curve based on what we just did up here. Okay, V and T are in this acceleration value right here, so we say this is acceleration. Okay, so another way of writing this is that acceleration is equal to dV dt. Okay, but there's another thing we can do with this curve that is also uh, useful. Okay, we can say that an area under this curve And we'll say that this is over a time interval. Okay. An area under this curve over a time interval can be evaluated. And what that looks like graphically is that you say, here is a kind of an initial time that we'll call T0. Here is another time that we will call just T. Okay. And we think about the area in this curve, which is right in here, okay. <clears throat> the way we look at that mathematically is we take the uh, a equal dv dt there and we rearrange it a little bit. And we say, what if we actually move the dt over next to um, the, uh, let's see, that's not the one I wanted to look at. Um, I actually want to go up and pick off uh, the one from up here. This is, if we look at this relationship right here, this is what allows us to uh, analyze this curve properly for the area under that curve. So what we want to do there is take VDT and DS. So we, we kind of first start with that and say DS is going to be equal to VDT. Okay, because you even though these are derivatives, it is possible for you to take those things apart and treat it like a normal fraction. You can do normal uh, mathematical operations with them like this. And once you set it up to where you have these differentials, it allows you to integrate those over a particular domain. So you can integrate ds, for instance, uh, from an initial position. Um, I think I... I uh, need to kind of change this a little bit. No, that's it. Initial position to a final position that we call uh, S. And then we can also integrate this over time since that's the type of variable we have for the differential there, T0 up to T. Okay. So on the left, what does that give you? All right. What it gives you on the left is it gives you basically just a difference in position. So you have s minus s0. On the right, the presumption is that v could be a function of time. That's why it's a curve in this space. So v can be a function of time. And uh, what you find there is we would need to know what that function was in order to be able to actually uh, integrate it. And so that's, we kind of just have to leave it alone and say you have to integrate from t0 to t. Uh, of that function v of t with respect to t. Okay, and one of the other ways that this is written a lot of times is that s is equal to the integral from our initial time to our final time of v dt, and they take that initial position of s and they move it over to the other side. So that's another common way of writing that same equation. Okay, all right. So these, these kind of become some important equations for us to, to uh, work with. I'm going to do some other ones here as well. Um, you know, be a little bit patient with me. I'm trying to develop a, a few different things for us to use here, and then I'll use them in an example, and hopefully it'll start making a little bit more sense once we start using them in some examples. All right, the next curve that I want to approach here is the acceleration versus time curve. Okay, 
And just uh, by the way, I'm not trying to connect any of these curves with any of the, the last ones per se. Um, you know, in other words, the V curve that I put there isn't the V curve for the S curve that I just put or anything like that. These are somewhat unconnected with each other. I'm just trying to kind of lay out the, uh, the ideas here. All right, so acceleration versus time. And again, we, uh, we can have another curve. It doesn't matter what direction the curve is, uh, is moving there. Um, and let's, again, look first at what if we uh, want to know the meaning of the slope of this curve at a particular point. Okay. Um, the slope of that AT curve is something that's kind of funny, all right? This is basically, if you think about this, acceleration is the second derivative of position with respect to time. The slope of it is basically going to the third derivative of position with respect to time. And uh, it has a name. It is actually called jerk. Now, the interesting thing for us is jerk is actually something that's interesting to study but it's not incredibly important for the purposes of this class. The reason that, that we have to study kinematics in this class is that we need enough kinematics to deal with all of these methods that we started with right at the beginning, right? We need to be able to use Newton's second law, and the reason, you know, or, or what we need to use in second's law, or in Newton's second's law, is the acceleration term. Right? So it's important for us to be able to relate acceleration, velocity, and position. Uh, for the purposes of things we do in this class, we are not as concerned with this parameter that's called jerk. All right? uh, so I'll leave it at that. All right, so then what we'll do is think about the area. What about the area under the AT curve? over a particular time interval. All right, so again, I'll basically pick off two different times along here, call this T0 and this just T. And let's think about the area under a curve like that. Okay. What we do to kind of think about that area, we need a relationship um, that kind of has A and DT in it. And we look up here, and we definitely have a relationship that has A and DT right here. So we'll pick that one off, and we'll say A equals dV dt. We can rearrange that as dV is equal to A dt. All right, what do you think we do after that? Okay, the, the next step after that is we want to integrate these over that interval that I just defined. That interval goes from our initial time to some final time, okay? And over that period of time, the velocity will have changed from some initial velocity to some final velocity. Okay, and so what we get out of this is that um, the, the integral on the left just becomes the difference in initial velocity and final velocity. And on the right, again, uh, if we don't know what the function A is with respect to T, then there's no further we can go at this point with that integral. We can't actually evaluate it until we know what that function actually is. Okay, so here we have an integral from T0 to T of A dt. Okay. Or again, kind of like the last one, uh, sometimes this is expressed as, as instead of uh, final position, final velocity is going to be equal to this integral from t0 to t of A dt plus initial velocity.
All right, so there's a bunch of stuff. Um, let's actually look at a special case uh, in a, you know, sort of a derivation of a formula uh, way. Let's look at a special case where instead of acceleration possibly being a function, something that can change over time, let's look at it where acceleration is a constant. So let's say here constant acceleration. Okay, so for constant acceleration, what would this formula right here look like? So we, we have this formula that I have in the box right there. If that has constant acceleration, what can we do with that A in this most recent formula that I just came up with? What can, what can you do with constants whenever you have a constant inside of an integral? Is it okay to just pull it out? Yeah, so we pull it out. V is equal to A times an integral from T0 to T of dt plus initial velocity. Okay, well, the nice thing is now that we have that acceleration pulled out, this is, again, this is only in the case of constant acceleration. We can pull that out. Now we can actually evaluate this integral because there's nothing special about it. We just, you know, we just evaluate it and it actually becomes um, that V is equal to A times the difference in T, T minus T zero uh, plus initial velocity. Okay, so what does that actually mean? We want to know a new velocity. All we have to do is know the acceleration and the amount of time over which that acceleration happened. Multiply those two together and add whatever your initial velocity was. That gives you the velocity that you've achieved. Okay? So we have another one, though, that we can do as well. What if we want to know position? under this assumption of constant acceleration. What if I want to know the position of something S? All right. S, I can go back up to this uh, formula that I had up here and say that S is going to be equal to the integral from T0 to T of A times T minus T0 plus V0 right, dt, because I just came up with what velocity had to be under the assumption of constant acceleration. And then I also add like whatever my initial position was, s sub o. All right, well, I can actually manipulate this some. The first thing I can see is that I can pull out, well, let, let me actually do this first. Let me separate my integral out into a few different terms. So I have S is equal to an integral from T0 to T of A times T, but I'm going to pull the A out and just leave the T in there. I'm then going to subtract okay, uh, the integral from T0 to T. Again, I can leave the A out front, and now I have T0 dt okay then what okay I also have that initial velocity so I have plus integral from T0 to T of uh, and then I have of course a out in front of that no I don't because A doesn't get multiplied by that, right? Um, and so then I've got V0 dt, all right? And then lastly, that is not in an integral at the end, okay? Well, what do I do with that? Well, this can also be dealt with. So in order to take an integral of T dt, I need that antiderivative. The antiderivative 
you increase the exponent by one and divide by the new exponent, right? So what I basically do there is that I have a times t squared over two, okay? And that gets evaluated from t zero to t minus a times, what do I do here for t zero? t zero is actually also a constant, so I can pull that out. And now all I end up with is just uh, integral from t0 to t of dt, which just gives me t minus t0. Okay, Over here, v0, I can pull out of that uh, integral because it's also a constant. And that ends up just being v0 times t minus t0. And then at the end, I have the position. All right, I know this is a lot, you know, bear with me. We're going we're gonna to make it to the end of this because this is kind of cool, um, at least for nerds like me. Okay, so I have uh, A, and here I'm going to actually punch in my, uh, my, or put in my two different limits of this integration such that I have T squared minus T zero squared over two minus, here I have A T zero T plus a t0 squared, and over here is not much else I can do with v0 times t minus t0. Okay. Well, let's actually, you know, go even further with this. I'm actually going to pull out of this a uh, factor for the first three terms, I'm going to pull out of it a factor of uh, a over 2. Okay, but not quite yet. First, actually, I need to look at this. And here I have an a times t0 squared over 2. That'd be minus. And here I have plus uh, a t0 squared. And so what that actually ends up doing is it ends up giving me uh, I'm going to separate these out, a t squared over 2 minus a t 0 t. Uh, yeah, plus um, a t 0 squared over 2. Yeah, that makes sense. Plus v 0 times t minus t 0 plus S zero. I know this is a lot of math. Bear with me. Okay. So now what I want to do is pull out this A over two. Okay. When I do that, this S ends up giving me A over two times T squared minus T zero T plus and that would actually be 2 t0t, because I pulled out this factor of 2. It means I'd have to multiply by a factor of 2 to get back to just a t0t. Uh, plus, um, over here, I would have just t sub o squared. Plus v sub o times t minus t sub o plus s sub o. Now we're finally somewhere, because what can we recognize inside of this set of parentheses. That has a particular form to it, right? That has a particular, it's a, it is a two-factor, it's a two-term binomial, right? Uh, which I guess is redundant, but it's a binomial that is squared, right? And so that allows us to say here that this is going to be equal to a times t uh, minus t0 squared over 2 plus v0 times t minus t0 plus s0. And that is a very useful uh, equation right there. What does it actually tell us? All right. What it tells us is that under the condition of constant acceleration, uh, we can look at a change in time 
from an initial time to a final time, t0 and t. We can look at uh, a change in position by plugging it into this equation under that um, assumption. All right. I know that took a little bit longer than uh, anyone really wanted. But I like to kind of go back to first principles at least one time so that you guys can see that all this stuff is just calculus, right? You just have to go back to the calculus. Most of the work that we do, we will generally relate back to uh, equations that we end up with in here. But I, I think this is instructive to get you to see uh, how the calculus builds up these equations. All right. Any questions before I move on? OK. We're going to actually go back to, uh, we were looking at these various graphs, S, V, and A. Now we're going to do one that's a little bit different. What if we want to do something that relates acceleration and position, or displacement, as, as I called it earlier? Okay. So what if I want to do one where we relate uh, you know, where we have A on the vertical axis and displacement on the other axis, and we'll look at a curve in there. Okay. What's interesting here is that if we start out at some initial position and we go to some final position, we can look at the area under this curve, and it actually kind of means something. And how can we prove that? Well, we actually have to go back to a couple of different uh, relationships that we identified. One was that velocity was equal to the rate of change of position with respect to time. And the other one uh, is that acceleration is equal to the rate of change of velocity with respect to time. What we're going to do is take both of these and manipulate them so that we isolate the time differential. Okay, And that would give us, in this case, ds over v. And in this case, it gives us dv over a. All right. What I can then do is take those two things, and I can relate them together. I can say ds over v is equal to dv over a. But once I do this, I can actually kind of cross multiply, as some people call it and say that this is equal to v dv, or this implies that v dv uh, is equal to a ds. OK, well, how is this useful to us? Once I set it up in that form, I can integrate both sides of it. And when I integrate both sides of it, on the left, I can go from an initial velocity to a final velocity. On the right, I can go from an initial position to a final position. All right, and once I do this, on the left, since I have that term of v in there, again, the antiderivative of that means you take the exponent, increase it by 1, divide by the new exponent. And that tells me that what I actually end up with over here is uh, v squared minus v0 squared. All this is over 2. It's over 2 because we divided by that new exponent. That's what I end up with on the left. What I end up with on the right, um, well, there's not actually much more that I can do about that because I haven't defined what exactly my acceleration function is with respect to position. Right? So I just leave that alone and say the integral from s0 to s of a, again, it's, just, it's presumed that a is a function of s in this case, ds. Or another way that you might see this written on occasion is that v squared is equal to 2 times the integral from s0 to s of uh, a ds. Okay. Uh, plus initial velocity squared. All right. Well, that's, uh, you know, that's interesting and all. Uh, there is a special case of this one as well that's good for us to know about. What about constant acceleration? OK. 
Okay. Well, for constant acceleration, what can you do with A? It comes out of the uh, integral there, and it allows us to do V squared is equal to 2 times A times the integral from S0 to S of just DS plus V0 uh, squared. That integral from S0 to S uh, DS can just be directly evaluated, and this tells us here that this will be 2A times S minus S0 plus V0 squared. Okay. And I guess, um, you know, let me write this this way to really encapsulate it. This tells us that our final velocity is equal to all of that. Oh, velocity squared is equal to all that. Okay, so that if you can find this area, you know, I guess this is the big takeaway. You find that area on the AS curve between S0 and S, it gives you the change in the squares of your velocities. All right. There's just a bunch of stuff to go through right at the beginning here. I promise we're not going to keep just doing math the whole time. All right, we'll do one more of things that are kind of like this, okay? What if we are talking about uh, velocity versus position? Again, I kind of use position and displacement somewhat uh, interchangeably. So here I've got velocity and displacement. Let's think of a curve on here and let's think of what does the slope of this curve mean. Okay, well the slope of that curve is going to be dv ds. Okay, well let's think about some places where we had dv and ds. We actually had this relationship up here where we had both dv and ds, right? We had this relationship right here. Let's bring that one back and see if we can, uh, you know, kind of come up with uh, what this might mean. Okay, dv ds, if I actually take that and I um, imagine, um, you know, multiplying by v, just, I guess I won't spend a lot of time manipulating that, but I say v, this is going to be equal to a. Okay, so if I'm going to interpret this in words, what does this actually mean? Well, it means that uh, I can figure out what an acceleration is, all right, acceleration is what I have right here, is equal to whatever your current value is of velocity. That's what v is. So in other words, if you look at this point right here, this would actually be the specific value of v at that point. And then, of course, the slope of this line is your dv ds. That's how you can figure out acceleration. It's equal to the slope of the line uh, at that point times the actual height value of the curve at that point. All right. The last thing I'm going to go over before we do an uh, example problem is what your book calls curvilinear motion. This is actually one of the funniest terms that I think I've, I've seen in engineering. It seems um, a little bit contradictory internally, right? You've got, is it curving or is it linear, right? The idea here is that you can apply all of this stuff that we just did for one dimensional motion we can apply all of those to two-dimensional motion just by individually applying uh, these principles in two different directions at the same time. And it's just like you do in statics. Uh, you split it into components. You talk about X motion, you talk about Y motion, and the two you can treat separately from one another. And so here's kind of what that looks like. Um, 
you can talk about a particular position vector of a uh, particle. A lot of times they use the variable r like this. In order to describe the position of a particle, you can give its x-coordinate and multiply by an i-unit vector. You, to this, you can add a y-coordinate multiplied by a j-unit vector. To this, you can add a z-component multiplied by a z-unit vector, which is typically k. You know, i, j, and k give you your unit vectors in each of those directions. Okay. All right. Well, um, whenever we think about trying to take the derivative of this so that we come up with uh, a velocity vector, okay, what we need to do, you know, this is just a sum of quantities, which means as soon as we figure out how to find the derivative of one of them, we just take the derivative of one plus the derivative of the other one plus the derivative of the other one, and we get, up, get the total amount. So let's kind of on the side over here. How do you come up with what is the derivative of x i with respect to time? Okay, and it might seem like well, you know, i is just a constant, right? So you can just pull that out, and you can just take the derivative of x. Here's the thing, and I'm, this is a seed I'm going to plant right now that we're not going to do much with at least right away, um, but all of this stuff that we're doing, one of the tricks that you can do that we will probably get to later in the course is we can have uh, moving reference frames, right? So your axes themselves can move. And if your axes themselves can move, then it means that we can't necessarily assume that i, j, and k are constants with respect to time. They might be moving. And if they're moving, then those vectors could also have uh, you know, derivatives that are associated with them. In which case, we look at this and we say, well, I can still take the derivative. I just use the product rule. Right? The product rule says that you take the derivative of one of your factors with respect to t times the other factor and add to it the derivative of the other factor and multiply it by the first factor. Now, here's the thing. For us, if we are talking about non-moving uh, coordinate systems, okay, so I'll say assuming fixed coordinate systems, which is what we're going to do right now, what can we do here? What happens to this term right here under fixed coordinate system? This becomes zero if uh, your reference frame is fixed. Okay, so if that's zero and we're saying assuming a fixed coordinate system, what can we do here? Well, all we need to worry about now are the derivatives uh, that have to do with our x, y, and z coordinates, okay? And let me give you a little bit of, of shorthand that we're going to start using in here. We don't want to have to write dx, dt every single time that we're talking about uh, the derivative of position with respect to time. And so we'll go ahead and say here dx, dt, a shorthand for that is just x dot. Okay, so down here, this is, I'm basically talking about the dot notation. Up here, this was a product rule. Okay, under dot notation, how do you think you would describe a second derivative? Something like this. How about two dots? All right, so we're talking about time derivatives. The derivatives with respect to time, we use this dot notation to talk about those. So our velocity vector then becomes just x dot i plus y dot j plus z dot k. 
And all that means is that we're, we're treating each direction separately, right? We can figure out how, what the uh, velocity is by just looking at the velocity in the I, the velocity in the Y, the velocity in the, in the uh, Z, and this gives us our total velocity. What about our acceleration? Well, again, it's just x double dot i plus y double dot k or j uh, plus z double dot k. All right. What if you want to know like an, uh, a speed? What if I want to know the speed of a particular particle and I happen to know my velocity vector? What do you think I do? Well, it is a vector, and so to figure out what the length of the kind of resultant is of all of those vectors, of course, we're not talking about resultants because resultants are for forces, but you think about the overall length of a vector in three space like this. You take x dot squared plus y dot squared plus z dot squared, take the square root of all of that, and that gives you your overall speed. Okay. All right. We're almost there. One last little thing. There are occasions where the motion of a particle is defined by a prearranged path. Okay. So if there's a path along which an a particle is already moving, so I'll kind of draw this here where let's say we're dealing in an X and Y coordinate system. And there's some sort of a function here. This function is, I won't give it to you, but it's, there's some sort of a function that describes this and a particle is moving along this path. Okay, and whatever it, whatever it is, is constraining it to move along the path. So as a big heading here, let me uh, say this is constrained path motion. Okay. Well, one of the things that we can say here is that both X and Y are functions of T. So I have X is a function of T and Y is a function of T. Okay. In that case, then I can say Y is equal to F of X but both x and y are functions of t. That means if I want to take the derivative of, of y with respect to t, I have to actually use something that's called the chain rule. Okay, and what that looks like is that dy dt is equal to dy dx times dx dt. Okay, and that's kind of the basis of the chain rule that you might remember from calculus. All right, and uh, without knowing my f of x function, that's about as far as I can go with this for right now. And the reason I have to do that again is that both x and y are functions of t, and we need to think about our time derivatives, not just our um, kind of spatial derivative of x and, you know, x with respect to y or y with respect to x. All right, that's a load of stuff, right? But I wanted to get it all out there because now we're gonna do an example problem, all right? You ready for that? So here's the example problem. Let's say that we have a situation where we have a collar that is sliding on a rod, right? And the rod is bent into a shape that, is, that can be described with the function that you see right there. Y is equal to 100 centimeters squared over X. Let's further say that something comes along and gives this little collar right here a specific velocity in the X direction. Although it's not a specific velocity, it's a, it's a velocity described by a function, okay? So in the X direction, 
Uh, it's given a velocity that's described with 16 centimeter per second squared times t minus 4 centimeter per, uh, centimeter per second cubed times t squared. Okay, we're going to assume that the collar starts at a position of, or a height of 20 centimeters at time zero. Okay, so what that means is that it's, it's drawn on there, right? This is starting at a height of 20 centimeters at time zero. All right, and then what happens is we give it this x velocity profile with respect to time. And we're looking basically within the first four seconds of its motion, right? So over the first four seconds, roughly what the x component of velocity looks like is this parabola. And it's given with that function. Here's what we're supposed to find. We're supposed to find the x and y components of position, velocity, and acceleration that the collar experiences when we reach a time of three seconds, right? So after three seconds have elapsed of this motion, let's figure out the x, y, x and y components of position and velocity and acceleration after those three seconds. Part two, hopefully we'll have enough time to get to this. If not, I will record it and, uh, and I'll put it out there for y'all to see it, but plug this into MathCAD and uh, you know, and verify the results of part one, and then move on from there um, and do some interesting things like develop some plots. All right, so let's get started with this. Actually, the very first thing that we need to do for this problem is uh, we need to actually determine what the initial x position is of this collar. That's something that we actually don't know right now. So. What we do for that, this isn't, this isn't super complicated, but I'll say, I'll put a heading on here that we are finding uh, initial uh, x position. Okay, all we do for that is we plug in our known initial y position, 20 centimeters. All right, we'll plug that in and then we will also you know, have the rest of this expression here, 100 centimeters squared over x, and we'll solve for x. Okay. And if the numbers were more complicated, I would pull out my calculator, but I don't need to. What is x? x should be 5 centimeters. Right? And keep in mind, this is actually our initial position for x. Okay? Another way of saying this is that this is x at time zero. Okay? So far, so good? All right. The next step that we want to do here, let me actually move this down a little bit. The next step that we want to do is we want to determine what is the position, the x position as a function, or not as a function, well, let's, let's do it that way. Let's first do it as a function of time, okay? So x of t, okay? How do I determine x of t? Well, I have v of t. Right, I have velocity as a function of t. How do I go from my velocity graph to a position function? Okay, if you go back to your notes just a few seconds ago, the, what, they, what you need to do for that is to integrate, all right, from our initial time, which we're gonna take to be zero, up to whatever our final time is, which I will do this in terms of just a general time t first, right, of our velocity function, which is 16 centimeter per second squared t minus four centimeter per second cubed t squared, okay, all of this dt, okay? And actually I miss, I need, I need one other thing on this function. What else do I need? 
if you go back to the, the derivations I did a second ago, yeah, you want to have your initial position in the x. So I also add on to this x0. Okay, and x0 for us is what? Okay, the x yeah, that we just found here is the initial x position is 5 centimeters. All right, so now what? Okay, well, what this ends up being, okay, we have to take this, this has a variable of t in it right here. And so, uh, and this goes from 0 to t. So that means since the, the lower um, element of this integrand is 0, the, the kind of that starting position is 0, it's going to make it to where um, none of our terms at that point are going to show up. They're all going to drop out because they are 0. So we really only have to look at the upper limit of that in integration, and it ends up being, um, you know, again, you take the exponent, increase it by 1, and divide by the new exponent. That leaves me with 8 centimeter per second squared, okay, because I'm dividing by 2, because I'm dividing by the new exponent, uh, times t squared. Minus, what do you think I do with this one? All right, here, again, I take that exponent, increase it by 1, and divide by the new exponent. All right, so what I do there is I'll have 4 uh, thirds, because I'm dividing by the new exponent, which will be 3. 4 thirds centimeter per second cubed, t cubed, plus 5 centimeters. And what I've now done is come up with a function that gives me the position of my collar in the x direction with respect to time. What does the question actually ask for? Well, it asks for what is this at time equal 3, right, at 3 seconds. So how do I get that? That would be written like this, by the way, x at 3 seconds, okay x at 3 seconds is 8 centimeter per second squared times 3 seconds squared minus 4 thirds. Oh, let me put those units in there as well. 4 thirds uh, centimeter per second cubed times 3 seconds cubed plus 5 centimeters. All right, and I can punch that in the calculator, right? It ends up being 8 times 3 squared minus, here I'll do 4 times 3 cubed over 3 plus 5, okay? And this ends up telling me that three seconds from the starting point, my collar has now moved to a position that is at 41 centimeters. Awesome. We've done our first step. Okay. We're supposed to find the X and Y components of position, velocity, and acceleration. So let's get all of our x components here. Let's finish with our x components. The nice thing is, while we're doing our x components here, it doesn't matter that the collar is on a curved path like this. We are basically doing the same math as just a plain old linear problem, right? We don't care that this is on this curved path because we're given this x velocity as a function of time, right? So at this stage of the problem, we don't necessarily care that it's on this curved path these steps would be the same even if it was on a straight path in the x direction. Does that make sense? Okay. All right. So let's look at the next piece, the velocity, right? We're, we just did position. What about velocity? x dot of t. Well, this is easy, right? What's x dot of t? x dot of t was given. So how do I get, actually, instead of doing x dot of t, that's not very interesting. I already have that. Let's put in x dot of 3 seconds. Okay, what does that look like? 
well, that'll be 16 centimeter per second squared uh, times in here we'll put in three seconds do I square it okay no I don't because it's in that velocity function that I started with up there it's not squared okay here I subtract four centimeter per second cubed all right times three seconds squared okay and it starts from rest, right? I think it said that earlier up there. Um, well, anyway, it, it, you didn't have to say that because the function implies that it starts at rest at time zero, okay? So we leave that alone, and when we plug those values in, we have 16 times three minus, oops, minus four times three squared. Okay, <clears throat> and this ends up giving us 12. What, what are my units? Okay, in the first term there, I've got centimeter per second squared multiplied by seconds. So that gives me centimeter per second. The second term, I have centimeter per second cubed multiplied by second squared. So that gives me centimeter per second as well. So I'm, I'm good saying that this is centimeter per second. Okay, and what's the last thing I need to do in the x direction? Okay, I need to figure out my acceleration, right? So to get my acceleration, x double dot, I'll do that as a function of t. What do I have to do there? That is the derivative of velocity with respect to time. So it's basically equal to d dt of 16 centimeter per second squared times t minus 4 centimeter per second cubed times t squared. All right. And what is that? How do you take a derivative? Well, <clears throat> take the exponent out in front and lower it by one. That's the kind of the rule for a polynomial, right? So here I have the exponent of t is one, and then I lower it by one. So this ends up giving me 16 centimeters, let me do it this way, centimeters uh, per second squared. minus, okay, here you again take the exponent out in front, lower it by one, two multiplies by four to give eight. So I have eight centimeters per second cubed, and I lower it by one, so this ends up being this times t. All right, well now how do I figure out my acceleration at three seconds? I'll just plug it in, right? So I plug in, this is equal to 16 centimeter per second squared minus eight centimeter per second cubed multiplied by three seconds. Okay, so when I do that, I've got 16 minus eight times three. And that means I've got negative eight centimeter per second squared. All right. So far so good? So any questions so far on that? I'm going to reiterate this point again. Um, it didn't matter for this first half of this problem that the collar is sliding on a curved rod because we were directly given what the velocity is doing in the x direction. 
So since we know what that velocity is doing versus time in the x direction, we can just take an integral and a derivative, and that gives us position and acceleration in that x direction. And this would have been the exact same steps that we did if I had given you the problem that that collar was sliding along just a straight rod. All right, so it doesn't matter for the, at least for that direction that it's sliding along a curved rod. In the y direction, though, it does start to matter. All right, so the next, the next half of this problem gets a little bit more tricky. It's not actually that bad. Okay, so this is all the stuff that we did for the x direction. I'm going to slide it down so we can see the original stuff. All right, so the first one let's do, this is now the y direction. How do you think I come up with y of t? What do you think? Would you agree that y of t is just equal to 100 centimeters squared over x of t? Does this make sense? I mean, we're told here that, because I mean, x and y, like the collar can't be at, uh, at one time and another time at the same time, right? They have to both experience the same time, and so uh, we would have to say here that, you know, this would have to be how x and y would have to relate on as, as it pertained to that curve. Well, do I have x of t? I do, don't I? So x of t was given with this expression down here. All right. So what I want to do there is actually plug that in and say this is just going to be 100 centimeters squared over... 8 centimeters per second squared times t squared minus 4 thirds centimeter per second cubed times t cubed plus 5 centimeters. All right, so that is my y of t function right there. All right, so that wasn't too bad. Now I know what the velocity is uh, with respect to time. How do I figure out what my position is at three seconds? I'll just plug it in, All right? I say this is going to be equal to 100. Uh, centimeters squared over 8 centimeter per second squared times 3 seconds squared minus 4 thirds centimeter per second cubed uh, times 3 seconds cubed plus 5 centimeters. Okay. I'll tell you what, I won't waste our time punching that in. I do have the answer sitting right here, so I'll, uh, I'll just tell you this turns out to be 2.439 centimeters. Okay. Again, every once in a while I like to take a look at the units and make sure they look like they are working properly. Does this turn out to be in centimeters? Okay. As I look at that, it looks like the first term in the denominator have the seconds canceling completely, which leaves you just centimeters in the denominator. That knocks out one of the centimeters you have in the numerator, and you're left with just centimeters, right? That actually happens for all of the terms. The seconds knock out for all of them. All of the terms in the denominator turn out to just be centimeters. That knocks out one of the centimeters in the numerator, and it ends up giving you an answer in centimeters. Okay? So... That is my position in the y direction at three seconds. Okay, what's next? Velocity in the y direction?
Okay, I want to show you a slick thing that we just learned when I was going through um, some of the background information, some of the background to this, um, into to all of these problems, all the all that calculus stuff. Remember that dy dt, okay, which is by the way y dot, right? What is dy dt? It is dx, or excuse me, dy dx times what? dx dt? Okay. Well, what does this mean for, uh, for this problem? Can I come up with a derivative of y with respect to x? That's something I can do. Okay, like if I go up here, I can say, what is y prime? Okay, if I do this, remember what you do to take a derivative, you take an exponent out in front, lower it by one. What is the current exponent of x? Okay, it's negative one, right? So you take the exponent out in front, which is negative one, and you lower it by one. When you lower it by one, you go to an exponent of negative two. An exponent of negative two means you're dividing by that. Does that make sense? So this gives you the derivative of y with respect to x. Okay. So now what we can do with that is we can say dy dx is going to be equal to that minus 100 centimeters squared over x squared, and then what's dx dt? dx dt is just another way of writing what? x dot, right? It's the velocity in the x direction. So that means that's, you know, I've already got that up here. This is just times 16 centimeters per second squared times t minus 4 centimeter per second cubed times t squared. All right. So this is, you know, keep in mind down here, this x is actually an x of t, right? So I'm going to write it like this, x of t squared. Could I put in that x of t? I could, right? It would, make my, it would make my function a little bit bigger. Why don't I go ahead and actually do that real quick. Um, y dot of t ends up being minus 100 centimeters squared times 16 centimeter per second squared t minus 4 centimeter per second cubed t squared. all this divided by x of t squared, right? x of t is what? Okay, it's given right here, 8 uh, centimeter per second squared. Times t squared. Minus 4 thirds centimeter per second cubed times t cubed plus five centimeters. And because this is a, this uh, term for x right here is actually squared, I have to take all of this and square it. All right, what am I supposed to find? Am I supposed to find a function for y, or you know, the y velocity with respect to t? I'm supposed to find the function, or am I supposed to find what? 
supposed to find it at a particular point. So y dot at three seconds, okay, what do I do for that? You know, main thing is I got to plug in um, some things. I tell you what, I'll show you this. Minus 100 centimeters squared. I do kind of have to plug it in this upper part. Up here I have 16 centimeter per second squared times 3 seconds minus 4. centimeter per second cubed times t squared, not t squared, 3 seconds squared. Okay. What is x of t at 3 seconds? We already calculated that, right? That is what I'm talking about right here. This is x of t, and if we do that at 3 seconds, I already know that that's 41 centimeters, right? If I can just say this is 41 centimeters squared. All right. Again, I'll spare you some of the, the heartache of having to punch all of that into the calculator. What this turns out to be is a negative 0 0.714 centimeters per second. Okay, so the first one I had up there was the, the y position at three seconds. This is the velocity in the y direction, the y component of velocity at three seconds. Okay, and what's the last piece? I know, I know we don't want to do this, right? But here it comes. This is, this is the one that's not fun. I don't know, it's all fun. We want y double dot. Okay, the second derivative with respect to time. And we want to do that as a function of t. Well, what is that? Okay, well, let me just write it this way. It is the derivative with respect to t of all of that mess. Sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't. Let's see here if I can get it to work this time. Nope. All right. So we basically have the derivative with respect to t. I'll write it this way, of y dot of t. And you can see that up there, this is all the stuff that we would plug in right here. Does that look like a fun derivative to take? Okay, why is that a, that, why is that a pain? That's a quotient rule problem, right? You've got a quotient there. You've got to take the derivative of it. That is something we could do. It would just be a lot of math to work out on the page. What if all we care about is what is this value at three seconds? I'm going to put on here, this is painful. Okay, there are some things you can do actually. Many of you might have MathCAD. Do you all have MathCAD? If you don't yet, you should get it because we're going to use it in here. All right, so, um, and I do recommend that you get MathCAD 15 um, rather than MathCAD Prime. That's a recommendation, it's not an absolute, um, but MathCAD 15 is a lot more capable than MathCAD Prime, even though it's older. All right, so instead of doing it this way, if all you care about is what is this second derivative at three seconds, so y double dot at three seconds, this actually helps us out a little bit 
because I don't know if you knew this or not, but your calculator has a really, really nice function in it that it takes this derivative for you, right? So let me show you that. I can take this function that I put in up here, right? So negative, well, actually, I'll tell you what, I'll show you this first. Here's the function, d dx of a big old function, and you do it at a particular x value, right? So we're going to put in there negative. Now we have this fraction. We have 100 times, OK? Then we put in a couple of parentheses there for what we've got the 100 times. Up there, we've got 16 times what? t? Well, t is just the variable. So we put in x, because that's the variable that we're using. Then what? minus, okay, up there we've got 4 times x squared. Okay, now what do we put in the denominator? Well, we don't want to actually just put 41 in the denominator like we did for the last step. We need that function in there as a, as a function of t in order for this to work right. So we want to put in there, um, I guess I'll start out with parentheses that are squared. And from there, inside the parentheses, I'll put in 8 times x squared. Uh, then I have minus 4 thirds times x cubed. And then I have plus 5. Right? I'm not quite there because now I need to tell it where do I want this to evaluate. So I put in 3 for 3 seconds. Okay? And it comes up with an answer. All right? It says that my acceleration at a value of 3 seconds is going to be 0.894 or so. What would the units be? Centimeters per second squared. OK. So what I'm saying here is that going from here to here isn't too bad if you've got a nice calculator that can do that for you. And I am never one to, well, that's probably not a good thing to say. I think it's a good idea to learn math. I think it's a good idea to, to know how all this stuff works behind the scenes. And once you get really, really good at it, sometimes uh, you don't want to spend a whole lot more time doing it, right? You just want to cut to the chase. So if you have a nice calculator that gets there for you and you get an answer, I say that's all good. All right, questions at this point? No? All right. So here's my question for you. Do you want to dive into the MathCAD right now? I mean, want is, you know, that happens on various levels, right? Um, let's go ahead and get started with the MathCAD. And if I need to finish it up offline somewhere, then, uh, then I will do that. But we'll go ahead and get started with the MathCAD part of this problem. We just did part one by hand which was find the x and y components, position, velocity, and acceleration after three seconds. Actually, I'll tell you what, I'll do one thing here real quick. Um, what if I wanted to do my vector that was like my velocity vector? How would I write my velocity vector? All right, so I'll do it this way. The velocity vector would be what? At, you know, I'll do this at three seconds. Okay, just this, this is just to kind of give you an example of what this looks like. Um, I know what my y component of velocity is at three seconds. It is negative 0 0.714, 0.7 <clears throat> centimeter per second. So what would the unit vector be that I multiply by here? 
j, right? j goes with y. And then what? What about my x direction? Oh, that was down here. My x velocity is 12 centimeter per second. So I have 12 centimeter per second i. And if you want, you can also put on your k term, but we're doing a two-dimensional problem, so that's just zero. We're not considering there being any uh, x velocity, or excuse me, z velocity. If there was z velocity, what would we do? We would have a term that would be there in the z, and we would add that on there as well, where it would have a k unit vector. Okay. What about acceleration? Okay. Acceleration here for the y, we would have a positive 0.894. Was it positive? <clears throat> Centimeter per second j. Okay. And then we would have uh, for the x, oh, that was down here, at three seconds, negative eight centimeter per second. Squared, these are by the way, centimeter per second squared. Okay, like this. written in uh, vector form. All right, so now to MathCAD. I think you guys will really like this if you haven't seen it before. Uh, this makes this a lot easier, all right? So hopefully this isn't, doesn't seem like a burden and instead hopefully it seems like it's a, uh, a help for you. All right, here's the same problem again. And you'll see here that I already got started. I already defined a variable that was my initial position in the y. I also defined a function that is y as a function of x. Okay, and it looks the same as the one that I did before. Um, here I'm putting in t sub e. That's the variable I'll use to describe how much elapsed time I want to look at where I take this sort of instant in time and look at what the velocity and acceleration and position are, right? That way I can use that as a variable, and if I want to use it, I want to find that at a different time than three seconds from now, I can do that and just by typing in one number, okay? Down here, this is the function that gives me the velocity in the x direction as a function of time. So all that is just given information that I have already entered here into my MathCAD sheet. All right, so the first thing we should probably do is just like we did before, we should probably find uh, what is the x position. You might say, well, we already found it, but I want MathCAD to find it because I don't want to have to update this manually if I go and I update my sheet. So I'm going to put in a solve block real quick that does this. So to put in a solve block, you have to first uh, you know, put in the variable that you're trying to solve for. And also I'll say this is my x position, which I'll just say is one centimeter. Okay. Type in the word given. Then I put in the, the uh, formula that I'm trying to solve for. And that is actually just, I've already defined what this function is, y of x. So what I'll basically do is say y as a function of x zero. Okay had better equal to whatever the y0 uh, value was that I just had up here, okay? This, this equal sign I'm using is the Boolean equal sign. So I put in y0 like that, okay? A lot of times when I'm doing a solve block, I will take special effort to go in and highlight some of these regions differently kind of give a marker to myself that I was defining that to be an initial value, an initial guess for this solve block. Okay, so given y of zero or y of x zero equal y zero. Now down here, I'll say x zero is equal to find x zero. 
And we should see that x0 for this is equal to 5 centimeters. Okay, none of this should really uh, be that surprising to you. I'm going to show that border there. So what, would I, what I did right here, I'll put a heading on it. I'll say I'm finding the initial uh, position in the x direction. All right, something else that might be kind of interesting is to go ahead and put in here, do we, did I sketch the shape of this path correctly, All right? So let me put in here a, uh, a little plot. Uh, I'll insert a graph. And on this graph, um, up here, actually, you, you don't see it right now because I have it hidden. But uh, I put in this other um, X range that I had hidden back behind there. X range is basically allowing this to range um, from roughly zero up to 40 centimeters. So I'm going to put that in right here as an X range. Okay. And I'll do that. Whenever you want this to show up with the right units, you divide by the units that you would like to see. Up here, we put in Y uh, of this X range. And again, I'd like that to show up in centimeters. Okay. Um, I don't particularly like, you know, how far that went in that direction, which is fine. I can clip it off. I'll have it go up to 40. Okay. Does that look approximately right? Sometimes I just like to do that to, you know, verify that we're not crazy. All right, what's next? How about our horizontal direction, our x direction? Okay. All right, so in the x direction, I already have a v of x function there, right? So um, that one's, you know, fairly simple. What else do I need? I need a position function for x, right? Well, let's just call that x of t, right? It's going to be a function of t, right? Well, x of t is just equal to, I'm going to put in the definite integral, It is an integral from 0 to what? t of what? Here we'll just put in v of x, okay, which is a function of t. If you look up here, v of x, this function that I have right here, is a function of t, okay, uh, dt. What else do I need on here? plus my initial position in the x direction, okay? Now, something to say about this. When you do calculus like this on a function, it's really iffy as to whether or not MathCAD is going to be able to show it to you in symbolic form. But it's actually doing it numerically behind the scenes, and it's available in just about any sort of format that you would like to know in terms of the actual numbers. So, for instance, I can say x of 3 seconds, which 3 seconds I used t sub e to have my 3 seconds in. And I can just use the evaluation operator and ask it to say, is that 41 centimeters? And it says, yep, that's 41 centimeters. Okay. A lot of times for results, I put a border around it like this. What about my velocity at 3 seconds? Well, that's easy. All I got to do is just put in v of x at t sub e. It should tell me this is um, 12 centimeter per second. Okay, so that part was easy. What about the acceleration as a function of t? 
So I'll say a uh, sub x as a function of t. What should this be? That should just be the derivative, right? The derivative with respect to t of v of x or v sub x of t. All right, so I go over here and I say, is a, of x, a sub x of t sub e, what is it? It's going to be equal to, I want this in centimeter per second squared. <laughs> centimeter per second squared. Okay, do those jive with what we got before? Sure, it looks like it to me. Okay, so that's my horizontal direction. What about my vertical direction? We'll do that over here, y direction. Oops. Okay. <clears throat> All right, in the y direction, Let's first do one where we come up with a slope function. I'll name this y prime of t. How do I do that? Well, I do d dx of what? All right, I just came up a few seconds ago, um, or I, I have actually up at the top of the, of the sheet, y of x. So I'm going to put that here, y of x. And that's actually, I didn't mean to put t right here. This should be x. So y prime of x is this derivative like this. Okay. And I don't actually need to use that for anything in particular. I just need to have it defined there so I can use it later on. Um, down here, let me put in y of x of t sub e. What does that do? Okay, what is that that I just found? Those two aren't related to each other, by the way. That's why I'm kind of dropping one down a little bit. <clears throat> Okay. All that I'm doing there is I'm saying once I have found the x position at three seconds, all I have to do is take that position and plug it into my y of x equation, and that gives me my y at that time. And that seems to work because it gives me the same result that I got with my written solution. All right. Now what? We have to actually do something real here, right? To figure out my v of y, we do the same thing uh, that we did a second ago. Whenever we were doing it by hand, we just need to do the MathCAD equivalent of it. So here we'll do y prime. This is the derivative. This is going to be as a function of x, but x is found as a function of t. Do you agree with that? All right, this now gets multiplied by v of x. Okay, and so now that I have that function defined for my velocity in the y direction, okay, I can plug in my test value, my, my uh, evaluation, the point at which I want to evaluate this, okay, and it should give me a value which is consistent with what we had before, doing it by hand. All right, 
Any questions yet? Does that, did what I did right there, did that make sense? Okay. So now we want to go to acceleration. And acceleration in the y, again, as a function of t. All right? And for this, we don't actually have to do anything super complicated for this. All we have to do is now take the derivative of v of y with respect to t. So now here we've got a of y as a function of t. Actually, I wanted to do t sub e, right? And I'm going to evaluate that. And again, we come up with the same value we came up with um, doing it by hand. All right, so for part two up there, See that part two? Use MathCAD to verify the results of part one. Additionally, plot the components and the magnitudes of the velocity and the acceleration of the collar as functions of time. All right. We are getting close here to running out of time together. So here's what I'm going to do. I actually have a version of this sheet that is already completed. And I just want to show you what those graphs end up looking like. Putting those graphs on here is not really all that hard. Um, and I, I kind of, if that's something you struggle with in MathCAD 15, I've got other videos that are out on YouTube already that kind of show how you can put a, a plot on here and format it. Uh, so I won't spend a lot of time on that. Instead, let me go in here and open my other sheet. Okay. Did all the same stuff, basically. Oh, I did a, a couple other things, though, that are interesting. I found the speed along the path. How did I do that? Well, all I did is I used that formula that I showed you on my initial thing. Square root of the sum of the squares of your velocity components gives you speed. Okay. One thing that's interesting here is if I want to get my absolute acceleration magnitude, I can do the same thing, but it actually is a different um, result than looking at the speed along the path, right? Because there's actually a speed that's associated with moving along the path and an acceleration associated with moving along the path and an acceleration that is associated with the fact that you are curving. We're going to talk a lot more about that in our next lecture, okay? But those are two different things. That's one of the points I want to make. One of the things I asked you to do was find where do you have your maximum uh, speed. And so what I actually did here is I did the plots first down here. Here's what your plots look like. Okay. And I noticed that where the speed is the fastest is probably right here. Right? What you actually see here. The red curve is my x direction. The blue curve is my y direction. I take the square root of the sum of the squares of those two values, and that gives me this function up here for speed. I can plot that function right up along here. And by the way, I'm not doing any tricks. I'm just taking these functions that I have defined in MathCAD and plotting them. All right? There's nothing extra I had to do. Um, right here is where it winds up being the highest. Right here, uh, one of the things you can do in uh, these plots is you can do something that's called trace. That's one of the ways that you can get a pretty decent value. Um, you can kind of trace along here and figure out where does this reach the maximum. So you can see there it reaches the maximum probably right around there. Um, but if you want to do that a little bit more formally, you can look at the time where that occurs and you can do a little solve block and figure out where does the acceleration go to zero. Acceleration is the derivative of velocity. Uh, wherever you reach that maximum velocity and start changing again is where you have zero acceleration. So you basically say where you have zero acceleration, close that, um, 
is where this derivative of your speed uh, is equal to zero. All right, so I found that, and that gives me a time of 0 0.508 seconds where the acceleration is zero, which finds that highest point for me. Okay. Now, the left graph over here is the easiest one to digest of the two, right? It kind of makes sense. This is actually really cool. In the y direction, you'll see it accelerates really fast at first, and then it falls off uh, in an interesting way. Why does it do this? What do you think? Why does it, why does it have a velocity profile that really speeds up really quick and then falls off again really quick? Why do you think? Right, it's because of the slope. You go back up and look at the shape of that path, you're moving at a, a given x velocity, and that means it has to move quite a bit in the y in order to stay at that x velocity. That's why it, it speeds up so fast in that y direction. That's what causes this hump in the overall speed right here. Okay. Now let's look at the acceleration graph there, because that's also kind of interesting. All right, uh, x and y components don't seem like they are that crazy to me. First of all, x component, it just looks like it's a sloping line. Why is that? Well, we were given that the x velocity was a parabola. So the x acceleration is basically what? It's the derivative of that, and the derivative of a parabola is a line, right? So it makes sense that that would be a straight line, okay? For the y component, there's your y direction there, um, it makes sense here that that would have to have a really high acceleration at first, um, but as it started going, it would actually have to start, uh, you know, kind of flipping the direction of its acceleration and then tapering off, okay? The ones that are, that are super interesting to me are the difference between your absolute magnitude of your acceleration, which is given with this gray curve right here, right? That's your absolute magnitude of your acceleration versus the acceleration that is experienced along the path. In other words, that's kind of what it would feel like if you were driving in the car, right, along this path, and it was what you would feel like in the back of your seat, right? So what you see there is that you will have uh, a positive acceleration, or a, excuse me, a, yeah, positive acceleration at first, and then you would actually have a negative acceleration for a little while, followed by a little positive acceleration, and then it would kind of, uh, after a while, the dominant direction of motion is the x, and so you see all this overall speed kind of falls off right along, or speed, I shouldn't say, it's the acceleration, matches what's happening in the x direction because as it continues to move, it's mostly moving in the x. That actually happens on both of these graphs, right? As you continue to move, the overall motion tends to go along with the x because that's, you know, most of that motion is happening in the x. All right. Um, I'll mention this too before we go. I also plotted the direction angle Right, so this kind of tells you what the overall direction of acceleration is, and this one is plotted versus the axes you see over on the right. And so when you first start out, you're kind of at, this is you know, relative to standard position where zero is in the positive x, right? So you start out at about negative 90, okay? Does that make sense? Is that where most of your acceleration is happening is negative 90? And I would say yes, the reason why is that you're really having to accelerate a lot downward along this path, right? So that should be, that, that makes sense that that would be the direction of absolute acceleration right at first. But then what happens? It goes through a couple of transitions and where does it end up? Your acceleration ends up at 180. What is, how do we interpret that? That basically means it's pointing straight backwards, right? Straight in the negative x direction is what this means. So what does that physically mean? Well, it basically means that because this velocity increased and is now decreasing and is more or less all happening in the x direction, 
It's not all happening in the x direction. Most of it's happening in the x direction and you're decreasing in speed, that means your acceleration happens in the negative x direction, right? So that direction uh, angle also makes sense for that motion. All right. That was what I wanted to cover today. So that's a big first day, I know. But uh, do you all have any questions that you'd like me to touch on before we head out? We good? All right. <laughs>